confluence of events that kind of led to this moment. Um, I'm, I'm super excited though, because what I get to present to you today is the introduction of what I hope will be a major research clinic um, for floating, purely specialized for studying the effects of floating on the brain, and also studying it in patients with psychiatric illness. And when I surveyed the whole literature of floating, there's really been very little work done in actual patients with anxiety. There's been a whole slew of studies showing that if you're healthy, you go into a float tank, you're going to reduce your levels of stress and anxiety. That's clear. But actual patient work has been very little. And shortly after this time, a lot of things came together, and now I'm actually going to have the chance to find an test. And it's super exciting uh, to, to have this opportunity. I think it's very fortunate to have it, actually. So let me kind of paint the picture of how I got from working at Caltech last year and coming to a close conference and talking about doing research to finally being at the Laurier Institute for Brain Research, which by the way is not in Pasadena, but also Oklahoma. I'm a long ways from home. So uh, let's start with the talk from last year. This is the human brain. This is the cortex. And so much of this brain, at least the external surface, is about processing the external world around us. And when you think about what happens in a float tank, you have a profound transformation of the processing in the brain itself. So to begin, you knock out a large swath of the visual cortex. When you're in a tank, not a single photon of light should be stimulating the visual cortex. So this is going to alter a large part of the posterior area of the brain. And if you have a well-calibrated tank that's soundproof, what you'll find is you're going to also knock out the information that's coming into your auditory cortex. If the tank is big enough and you're totally still, and you're not bumping into the sides of the wall, you'll have no tactile sensation at all. And so the somatosensory input is going to be dramatically reduced. And sort of deeper in the brain, you have a whole set of regions that respond to the day-to-day -day fluctuations of gravity, kind of orienting our body in, in space. And the proprioceptive and vestibular input that goes into those areas is going to be not. And assuming you're not moving and fidgeting in the tank and you're remaining completely still, a large part of your frontal cortex, which is devoted to movement, is going to be at an all-time low. And assuming you're not speaking or chanting or singing while you're in the tank, although some people do that, um, your uh, uh, speech output sensors are also going to be all the time. So you could imagine you have this huge surface of brain that receives input from the external world, and all of a sudden it's all it's all shut up. And you know, back in the days when floating was beginning, this was really uh, an enigma. What would happen to consciousness when you shut off a large part of the brain? But it turns out there's a really rich layer of consciousness bubbling at the surface. But it's bubbling underneath the surface, really. In the areas of the brain that process the internal body, the viscera, the heart, the lungs, the gut, the immune system, all of these organs and systems are actually on a dedicated pathway that bypasses the cortex, goes into areas like the brain stem, and exert a profound effect on all of our life, our consciousness included. And this is the area of the brain that unfolds with floating. You access it for the first time. Instead of being overshadowed by the external world, this becomes your world. This becomes your consciousness. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, experience, unlike anything you could obtain in the world out here. It's impossible. You can only do this with flow. And that's what really attracted me to the whole, the whole concept of flow. So keeping this idea in mind that 
the internal world of the body, a concept in the field that's known as interoception, is extremely important to flow. This is how I ended up at the Lorient Institute. Dr. Martin Paulus was my mentor when I was an undergraduate at UC San Diego. Without him, I probably would not have pursued neuroscience as a career. He, he was literally the person who got me interested in studying the brain. Now, Dr. Paulus is a psychiatrist, and he was working with a lot of patients. And while we were there, we were doing tons of studying in patients with anxiety disorder, patients with drug addiction, and we are using fMRI as our, our technology to study the brain. And he kept finding in all of these patient groups the same area of dysfunction in the brain. It turns out it wasn't in the cortex. Once again, it was underneath in the areas that process the internal world of the body. And one of the things that made Dr. Paulus famous in the field of psychiatry is his proposal. He said, we propose that altered interoception is the primary process underlying the initiation of an anxiety state. Further testing of this model may lead to the development of novel treatments that attenuate this altered interoceptive prediction signal in patients with anxiety disorders. So all this work that I was doing with Dr. Paulus and also his colleague Dr. Murray Steen was transformed into this idea that the, the critical piece to patients with issues dealing with anxiety is this interoceptive mapping of the internal body inside the brain. And if we could correct this, we could actually treat these illnesses. But up to this time, we hadn't figured out a way to do it. So I came back from the float conference, and I actually went down uh, to visit Dr. Paulus on a collaborative project we were working on. This was probably around uh, uh, maybe September or so, last September. <clears throat> And I explained to him the whole concept of floating. And I explained to him that, you know, this could be your answer. And sure enough, being my original mentor, he was totally excited by this idea. <laughs> and he turned to me and he says, it's really interesting because just last week, I got a call on the phone and they'd like me to be the new scientific director and president for the Laureate Institute for Brain Research. And as scientific director and president, he had the power to dictate a line of research. How are we going to go about treating psychiatric illness? And it turns out that's the mission of the Lawyer Institute. Their mission is to try to reduce the suffering of psychiatric illness by using all the novel technologies we have to study the brain. And they really tasked us with thinking outside the box to come up with new treatments. They wanted to use all the state-of-the-art research that we have about neuroscience and transform it into a treat. And this was a philanthropic endeavor by the Warren family. You can see uh, 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 Mr. Warren up there. And it's really near and dear to their hearts. They, they, they're truly invested in the idea of finding new treatments. And they put a lot of resources behind them. So for example, you see over in the, in the bottom right there, a uh, high-powered MRI machine. We have two of those totally dedicated to research. And they've integrated it with a 128-channel EEG system that you could measure simultaneously. And this is the only system in the world where you can do combined fMRI with EEG at 128 channels. And they've also developed new technology where you could literally see the brain in real time as the activation is going up and down in a particular region. And then you can modulate your own brain activation, this idea of neurofeedback in a way that hasn't been done before. So there's a lot of great opportunities at the Lawyer Institute just for studying the brain. How about studying patients with psychiatric illness? So it's a, it's a relatively new institute. In fact, what you see here is the Lorient Psychiatric Clinic and Hospital. It's a big hospital, one of the largest in the Midwest. And they're studying a ton of psychiatric patients, not just in the state of Oklahoma, but all the surrounding states as well. And this picture on the left is actually on Bing. If you go to Bing and look at their satellite images, this is uh, what you find. And in fact, 
That's where the Logan Institute is now, so I think it's a little out of date. Um, this, this had to have been taken before 2009, because it was 2009 when the Logan Institute was built. And now you can see the building in the photo on the right. It's a beautiful building. In fact, um, if you go onto the Google Maps and you take that little guy and put him onto the street view, this is the street view. And you can see the Laurier Institute right over here. It's a five-story building. And right now we've only built up the first two floors of the building. And we still have a lot of expansion to go. And behind this tree, on the first floor, overlooking this little lake, is going to be where the Flow Clinic and Research Center is. Where we have a great view. So, the question you're all probably asking yourself is, Oklahoma? <laughs> Trust me, I asked myself that a lot of times before I moved there last December. But it turns out, if you look back in history, the state of Oklahoma is remarkably progressive when it comes to flow drainage. And this is something I didn't know until I got. One of the world's first float tanks ever was built in Oklahoma City. And I, you guys might remember this picture, but it's the upright float tank where you're kind of floating in this weird space time. And this was Jay Shirley's float tank. Dr. Jay Shirley, who oftentimes gets kind of swept under the carpet in the history of floating, is such an important figure. Here he is at the Oklahoma City VA in his float lab. You can see the reel that's recording uh, uh, um, the patients who are uh, in the tank. And he didn't just study patients, he studied uh, NASA astronauts back in the 50s and 60s getting ready to fly to the moon. Um, some of the first female astronauts actually went through this clinic and NASA wanted to put them through a test to see how well they could handle that environment. And, and one of them actually could handle it better than any man. So Dr. Jay Shirley was a tremendously important researcher. He did a lot of great work. Some of the first EEG experiments with flotation came out of his lab. And, and one day, if, if, if the Florida boys will allow me, I'd love to come back and give a whole history lesson on Jay Shirley because he, he did a remarkable amount of work. Now, when you look back um, at why Oklahoma is the perfect place for this sort of float clinic, I think there's, a, there's several reasons. One is um, the psychiatric hospital that we're attached to. Like I said, it's one of the largest in the Midwest. They get about 75,000 outpatient visits a year. Um, quite a few inpatient visits as well. And it's really the main psychiatric hospital for the entire state and all the states surrounding it. So you're going to get access to a whole slew of patients who are coming there for treatment. Now when I was interviewing there, I spoke to all the main physicians and heads of the, the clinic and told them about my intentions to try to study this as a novel treatment. And all of them, without failure, said I would happily refer my patients. So I think we're going to have access to a tremendous amount of patients. They also have the world-renowned inpatient eating disorder program. Uh, 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 people will fly in from all around the country, especially uh, uh, mostly women with anorexia, to get treatment here. And unfortunately, we have very few treatments that are effective for anorexia as it stands. And so the, the head of this program was really interested in trying to use flotation as a potential treatment. So several other unique things about Oklahoma. Um, we have the second highest rate of mental illness in the US. It's not clear exactly why that's the case, but about 22% of our population has some form of mental illness. Many patients with severe anxiety, which is really uh, uh, what's near and dear to my heart, including veterans with PTSD, that we're going to have the opportunity to study. And also an abundance of drug addiction in the state. Um, methamphetamine and opiate addiction, as well as nicotine addiction. So when you combine the fact that we have this hospital that's literally immediately adjacent to our research clinic, 
and also the fact that we're in a state that really needs some help. I think this is a prime opportunity to develop and test a flirtation-based therapy to help patients with anxiety, with addiction, and anorexia. And all of these conditions really are about interoceptive disturbances. So, I get to uh, the Institute and now I need to build this clinic. And this is a challenge. I, I have so much respect for everyone in this room. Because building a float clinic is the exact opposite of the nothingness we are trying to achieve. <laughs> A close friend and colleague of mine, Jim Hefner, is, is the first one I heard to say this, and, and he's so right. Um, to, to be quite frank, I didn't realize how much anxiety it would cause to try to treat him. But uh, I can tell you, uh, I couldn't have done this without this man right here. saving grace of this whole operation. Uh, this is a picture of me meeting him last year, shortly after the conference at the float shop, Dylan introduced me. And you can actually see Colin handing me his card, and this is the card that eventually led to, to me asking Colin to be the designer of our float. And Colin is really one of the world's premier engineers for float sense. Uh, a, 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 a truly brilliant engineer. Um, he, he's been inventing things his whole life. In fact, back in the 60s, he was part of British Aircraft Corporation's uh, uh, um, main engineering team that uh, developed the Concorde Supersonic Jet. <laughs> so, it was really an honor to have Colin uh, designing the tanks. And last February, we had uh, Colin come out to the Institute, and you could see a, a whole group of people. Here we got uh, Colin there and his, his wonderful wife, Jeannie. Um, my laboratory manager, Kelsey, and then uh, Jim Hefner as well flew out for this. And we really kind of used this this week to design and, and develop the float plan. I spent a lot of time thinking over the past year, you know, what would be the ideal tank for patients with uh, psychiatric conditions? This is not a trivial issue. And the more I, I explored different tanks and actually tried them out myself, the more I realized how important it is to give them a lot of space. I think space is, is truly critical. And in that way, Leonardo da Vinci got it right. I really do believe you want to be able to, to spread out in the tank and not feel any form of claustrophobia. We'll get into that more a little bit later. But it turns out Colin is one of the world's only engineers of a round float tank. It's called the float around. And this is quite a large tank. In fact, uh, the tank itself is about eight feet tall. But the circular part of the tank is eight feet in diameter as well. So you can literally spread out in all directions. And he also makes an open air version of this. And when you look at this open air version, it's really no different than looking at a jacuzzi. And so this is precisely what our center is going to have. We're going to have an open version of this tank and a closed version of this tank. And the open version is really kind of the patients beginning to float. You know, they might have a lot of stereotypes that they've heard about floating. They might uh, uh, have a lot of things, and really fears, that prevent them from going into a tank. And my hope is when they see this open version, they're going to quickly dispel all those fears, and they're going to have no trouble getting into it. That's my hope. So, we started construction actually uh, last June, um, the same day my daughter was born. Um, and you can see here, this is going to be um, the future open room, and the tank will be kind of in this corner. And then right in the middle, we're going to have a large control room where all the physiological equipment is going to go. And then up over here is going to be the uh, closed room. And it's well underway now. They're uh, putting up drywall all the way to the decks, 
Um, we're working on soundproofing everything. We have quite a few layers of drywall with green glue, and by the end we should have an STC rating of about 60, which should be very, very quiet inside that. And um, my guess is, in the next month or so, uh, we should have operations at least beginning to unfold. Uh, Colin and Jeannie are here at the conference now, and they're going to fly back to Oklahoma with me, where we're going to start the, the process of installing the tanks. And this is going to take several months, because we're actually going to be outfitting the tanks with tons of different bells and whistles, uh, different physiological equipment, uh, different control panels, so we could adjust temperatures, um, both of the water and of the air, and calibrate things so they're very precise. And, and by the end of it, I'm convinced these will be uh, uh, the Rolls-Royce of flotation things. And thanks to Colin, really. So, I'd like to spend a moment talking about this, because I think it's relevant um, for a lot of people here in the audience. You know, a lot of the float centers and float uh, 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 places around the country and the world uh, cater to, you know, a lot of healthy people, and I think that's that's great to need that. But when you're starting to work with patient populations, it's important to really consider what goes into it. And being being a, a clinical psychologist myself, I had to really spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And I can tell you there's really two things you need to start thinking about if you want your center to be able to help patients with, say, severe anxiety. And claustrophobia is really one of them. I think this is one of the single biggest deterrents to getting patients with anxiety into a float tank. And I think it's, in general, a deterrent for a lot of people in the healthy population as well. And so it's important to be conscientious about how you create your tanks. You really want to get rid of the claustrophobia part of it. And I think the open version of the tank, where you're in a room that's totally soundproof and light, and the tank has no roof or ceiling, so you have no, no sense of enclosement. That's going to be critical for, for patients. And the other aspect is control. Patients with anxiety in particular need to feel like they're in control. And so you don't want to immerse them into the float experience right away. Really what you want to do is you want to create a sanctuary. You want this to be their time to explore their inner self. And one of the things you have to realize, these patients have been systematically running away from themselves for most of their life. So you can't just throw them into a tank and assume that they're going to be okay. You have to give them a, a chance to explore it at their own pace. So one of the things we're going to do at our center is make sure that they have complete control over the environment. If they want to have the lights on, they could. Um, we're going to have a, a, a whole nice set of LED lights so they can choose the color that they would prefer to have on. And then eventually, hopefully, they'll build up the courage to go into the full immersive flow without them. If they want to have music playing or nice quiet sounds, they can have that going on throughout the float, and then hopefully they'll reach the point where that could be silent as well. And we're going to have a full intercom system where the whole time we're going to be able to hear them, and if anything goes wrong, we can quickly uh, go and help. We're going to have psychiatrists and psychologists there, so if any negative experiences happen, we're prepared and ready to handle them. And another part of creating a sanctuary is they need to feel safe in their room. This, this needs to be their room for, you know, the few hours that they're there. And uh, we, we thought about that, and so what we decided is everything's going to be there. Uh, right next to the floor room is their own private bathroom. Um, they're going to have this, this great open shower. And literally, they can stay there as long as they want. We don't want to set boundaries for them. We really want this to be dictated by the patient. So, Beyond creating a sanctuary, we have to put a lot of thought into the water quality and the air quality. I think this is, um, unfortunately, something we haven't looked into as much in the floating field. We care a lot about water quality because this is what the regulators are doing. But no one's talking about air quality. In fact, you know, this is probably the most dangerous part of floating. So for example, take chlorine. Chlorine is well accepted in almost every you know, swimming pool and spa. In fact, a lot of states demand it. But this is a horrible idea, I think, for a floating well. When it mixes with organics, you can get very dangerous byproducts in the air. Things like chloroform, even cyanide. And you don't want patients inhaling this in an enclosed environment. 
So I really think it's incumbent upon us as an industry to, to educate the regulators and make them realize chlorine is probably not the best idea for, for disinfecting and sanitizing this environment. I think ozone may have some potential, but once again, breathing in ozone is very problematic for the lungs. And I haven't seen any tests to date looking at how ozone as a water treatment actually goes into the air and whether or not it can cause any problems. We need to do those studies. So what we decided is we're going to go with something that is really one of the safest ways of disinfecting the water, and also the safest on the air itself, and that's hydrogen peroxide. When it breaks down, it just breaks down into the water, and now it's totally harmless. But it's also a very, very powerful sanitizer. And when you combine it with high-powered UV, what you end up producing are these hydroxyl-free radicals. These are very, very powerful, powerful oxidizers. In fact, it has the second highest oxidation potential next to fluorine. Better than chlorine, better than bromine, better than ozone. So really the combination of UV with peroxide, I think is the ideal setup for both water quality and air quality. And we're going to be looking into all of this. So hopefully, like I said, this fall we're going to have operations up and running at the, the Flow Clinic and Research Center. And there's a lot of experiments. I, I'm having trouble sleeping at night thinking of all the great things we're going to be able to do in the coming years. And I think it really falls into two domains. Uh, uh, floating in the brain and floating in the body. Um, is going to be the research part of it, the real sort of basic science. What's happening in the human brain during the flow experience? We're going to have a, a, a 10 channel EEG system that's wireless and waterproof that will allow us to actually study this during the flow. And then as I showed you earlier, we have an MRI scanner just down the hallway. And we're going to be able to put people in and measure their brain activity both before and immediately after a float and try to understand how the circuits are altered in the brain by this profound experience. We're also going to have a lot of different physiological equipment to measure things like blood pressure, heart rate, cortisol, we even hope to measure some things dealing with magnesium. And this will get, get, give us a very clear idea of what's happening in the body and, and hopefully uh, in collaboration with, with Dr. Fine, who's done some of the seminal work in this, in this matter, we're going to be able to both replicate some of those great findings with the reduced blood pressure, the reduced cortisol, and also expand on them in patient populations. And I think this is going to be really the critical step to getting floating on the map in the medical we need to do randomized controlled trials. These are the same trials that all the pharmaceuticals use when they come up with their antidepressants and their anti-anxiety pills. But it's unfortunately the only way you're going to get your, your therapy, your treatment accepted in the medical community. You have to do these randomized controlled trials. And one of our goals at, at LIBOR is to actually do these trials in patients with anxiety, addiction, and anorexia. And I think flotation by itself has tremendous healing properties, and I think we could all agree about that. But I think when you're dealing with patient populations, you're going to have to actually go above and beyond just the floating experience. And by combining the float experience with uh, different types of treatment, including paraceptive exposure therapy, where you expose people to the perturbations in their internal body, or biofeedback, where you let them try to control things like their blood pressure or the theta waves. Um, or even meditation combined with floating could be very, very uh, 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 effective. And this is the sort of thing that we hope to explore at, at the research center. And then so much of psychiatry is always about getting rid of symptoms. You know, we're really focused in psychiatry on mental illness. When you think of the word illness, we're missing something, right? Where's the focus on mental wellness? And I think floating gives a chance for them. People don't just come out of the tank, you know, going from a negative five back to zero, and they oh, there's pretty good. Yeah. People come out of the tank and, and they're boom. I mean, they're, they're filled with life. And this is a great chance to do long-term follow-up to figure out how long do these effects last for, and how can it. You know, translate to the real world, the external world. 
And I think that doing this sort of long-term follow-up is going to give us a sense, how does this as a treatment compare to all the gold standard treatments that are currently out there? And by the way, those gold standard treatments aren't very good. So my hope is that we could actually do this research in a way that will be accepted by Western medicine and hopefully we'll get doctors all around the world to start referring their patients to us. But we have to do the research for us. That's true. So, in the midst of an anxiety epidemic, something I spoke about during last year's conference, the West is finally coming on board with Eastern treatments and philosophies that have been around for thousands of years. So much so that earlier this year, Time Magazine came out and called it the Mindful Revolution. And I, I, you know, it's kind of a funny uh, uh, title because anyone who's tried to do mindfulness in everyday life will find this is extremely difficult. I think a lot of patients that I've worked with when I try to get them to just say focus on their breath or meditate, find this to be one of the hardest things in life, to just stay still. There's so much distraction in our world. 24-7 connectivity. We're in such a unique time where we're, where we're constantly feeling this need to, to go and, and talk, and we're never just still. And so trying to teach people mindfulness is very, very complicated. But fortunately, I think we have a technology that teaches you just by experience. You don't have to do anything when you're inside a flip. You could take somebody who finds mindfulness extremely difficult and put them in a one-hour session and they're going to come out and they're going to understand what mindfulness really means. So my proposal to you, sitting in this room, is instead of a mindful revolution, let's all together start the float revolution. Thank you guys.